Hi everyone, welcome, welcome to everyone who's joining. Thank you very much. Very excited for this webinar, which is our last of the year, last of 2020, building reputation in 2021 for B2B businesses. Um, so I'm really excited. It's gonna be a fantastic one. I should have worn a Christmas hat, but I haven't. Um, I thought better of it. Um, welcome to everyone who's joining us. I'm Jenny Stanley, Founder and Managing Director of Appetite Creative, and I'm really excited to have everyone here today. Huge welcome to everyone joining us on the webinar. And as you just joined, I'll give you some quick tips uh, for today's webinar. Um, it's live. You have the option to ask our panellists anything you want. Um, whether they choose to answer or not is another thing. You have a live um, Q&A box, which you can see in your, in your Zoom settings. So if you're able to um, ask or submit your questions, we shall put them to our panelists. Um, another quick thing to note, we are recording today's session. So you will be able to watch the session on YouTube or listen to it on our podcast, The Talking Giraffe. So a big welcome to everyone. Um, we've got some really nice guests today, some fantastic experts. Um, we're talking about building reputation in 2021 for B2B businesses. And this makes up our series of webinars, The Talking Giraffe, that we started back in April now um, and really started to lift the lid on how different industries have been adapting and reacting to challenges and opportunities that have been brought to us by the pandemic. And now for 2021, how are we going to plan and work in our ideas, which probably massively changed from last year. For most businesses, 2020 was an experience they would rather not repeat. It's been a global pandemic and the worst recession on record. It's such a critical moment for so many B2C and B2B companies across the world. So it's more relevant than ever to build strong communications, strong social media and have a reputation strategy, not just to grow to the business, but also to look at building your reputation and building against the competition. So today we're going to discuss with our fantastic panelists. We're going to look at how B2B businesses use communication, use social media, and how they can use thought leadership to optimize their brand's reputation. Today, we will have our webinar split into three parts. Firstly, I'll be joined by Victoria Usher, founder and CEO of Ginger May PR, who will be helping us chair a panel with Leigh Solvisto. Leigh is the chief marketing officer at one of our longtime partners, Hybrid Theory. And he will, she will also be joined by Stephen Grimberg, who is director, senior director of marketing at Squirrel, who we have also been working with for almost a year now. So we're going to be looking at marketing and social media changes and the businesses have gone through lots of change this year, how we can actually benefit in our own businesses in terms of reputation. I will then be joined for our second part of the webinar. On the virtual stage, I will be joined by Chian Chua. She is founder and director of QC Immigration and Katie Atkinson, founder of The Runway Media. And we're going to be looking at how both of their businesses are advising other businesses on how to build reputation in 2021. Then to close today's webinar, Victoria Asher will again take the stage and she will take us through the best tips and advice when building reputation and relationships in a B2B world. So with no further ado, I do welcome our first panelists to the virtual stage, Leigh Solvista, Stephen Grimberg, and our chair today, Victoria Asher. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jen. It's going to be really weird next year, you know, and we have to get actually onto a stage having done so many webinars virtually. So it'll be it's going to be that whole pivot again where we get used to actually seeing people uh, in person. So, uh, yes, I also was going to wear a Christmas hat and felt it was possibly not. Uh, it would be a little bit distracting, but we could have all made it. We should do it next year for the next one, uh, for the next Christmas one. So. Uh, OK, so moving swiftly on, um, I will get uh, I will ask our panelists to introduce themselves in a 
moment, but just to give a little bit of context um, about what we're going to talk about. Um, this is going to be looking uh, a little bit back and then forward because we want to be looking to see where businesses are going and, and some of the sort of ideas that companies have and, and what they're actually planning to do for 2021. And I think for our audiences, that's what they'll be really keen to look at. So we're all aware, as Jenny's already said, about how businesses really suffered um, in 2020. Um, many were sadly smashed um, and haven't recovered, but actually many um, looked at the changes that were happening and the new landscape um, and were able to pivot and actually thrived. And, you know, lots of businesses were pushed into trying out and testing new things and actually found uh, to their benefit, they really worked. And actually some businesses have done absolutely brilliantly. And I know that the companies here have all, all fit into that category. Um, so, you know, it, it's great to hear about those positive stories and also obviously how people um, can pivot um, and particularly marketing directors that are, are presented with some quite difficult scenarios scenarios and they have to make the decisions quite quickly. So we're delighted um, to have with us today two really experienced marketing leaders. Um, we're going to discuss reputation and then also uh, discuss more about their businesses and what they're planning to do um, for 2021 um, and also looking back like I said to what they actually went through this year. Um, so I'd really love uh, both of you to introduce yourselves please, um, Stephen and also Leigh. Stephen, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so Stephen Grinberg, I'm with Squirrel. I've been with, in marketing for nearly 20 years now. Uh, hard to say that without laughing. Uh, most of my career has been with uh, startups and small businesses, and this allowed me to develop as a generalist, as there's often been a need to wear many hats. I joined Squirrel um, a little over three years ago now. It's been truly an excellent ride. As the, as the senior marketing director, I work with my team to help people learn how they can do more with their data and solve the more, more, most pressing business challenges. Um, just a little bit about Square, what we do is provide AI-driven insights and recommendations. These are delivered to the right person at the right time automatically. We help people find new opportunities, improve customer relationships, introduce efficiencies, and mitigate risks. We call this augmented intelligence as we uh, empower people to do more with their data. We don't replace them. Squirrel does this by connecting to your most relevant data sources. And uh, this is all textual and unstructured data it, it, that most systems can compute. So it's, it's commingled, it's contextualized to serve your specific business needs. You're then provided with these key insights and uh, action recommendations through intuitive dashboards uh, directly in the Squirrel platform or embedded in your workbench. Um, it's an incredible team that I respect and continue to be impressed with. And the platform and the Squirrel, uh, that Squirrel offers um, reflects this. I also love the work, the fact you're fully branded as well uh, behind yeah, you. So ju just to say as well that uh, Stephen's actually calling in from uh, New York City. So we are very pleased to have him here and he should right. really be mainlining coffee at this point. <laughs> Lay. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, uh, Victoria. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think, you know, my, my affair really started with marketing probably similar like Steve 20 years ago. Um, my, my, but my focus has always been media. Um, so I started with actually broadcasting media. So my first job is, um, is um, in China, central television. And so I was, a, I was an anchor and reporter um, actually in, Ch in China. Um, so after that, I went to went to Finland, did my international marketing degrees, and then started majority of my time spent with a brand, um, major brands like Nokia. I spent a good uh, good uh, decade with them um, in international marketing. Then moved on to travel segment around Expedia, and um, and further to that, um, moved around in Singapore and coming back to Auto Trader in the UK. So right now uh, I joined Hybrid Theory um, as Chief Marketing and really this year, just before the pandemic hit. And uh, so it's been very interesting, right? Um, I think uh, Hybrid Theory is, you know, is one of those um, long-standing ad tech companies. You know, we've gone through um, I think, you know, grew up with the industry really around ad tech, you know, in the beginning of like um, targeting trade trade desk, um, different type of um, segmentation of uh, audience um, really came out um, with a kind of a, a combination, you know, or formula, you would say um, around, you know, hybrid theory platform. Um, what we do essentially, we are data aggregator platform. So we, 
we take first party data and then third party data as well as we we purchase a lot of data logs um, we um, process about 20 billion data events uh, each month and um, you know similarly as a uh, as uh, Steve shared, you know, we model those data in order to gain a, a much higher um, media efficiency through different channels for our clients. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, as I said, very, very interesting area to be working uh, in, uh, you know, as, uh, as marketers in different fields and become more mature, you know, data has always been the key to many um, higher performance. And I, I love to, you know, share the experience uh, with the peer teams. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, this year has been uh, special for us. And we, you know, we started with uh, Appetite also, um, have been working with uh, Appetite for a longer time around, you know, how to position um, hybrid theories offering. So it'd be, you know, very happy to share, you know, our experience around that too. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Leia. That would be great if we can talk a little bit about what you've been doing with Appetite as well, because I think that's in context with, um, you know, particularly what, what's happened in 2020. So the the focus of this uh, session today is about reputation. Um, so I think it's probably best if we start by defining what that actually means to both of you. So, Stephen, if I can put that to you first, how would you define reputation, please? Sure, sure. Um, for me, it's, it's being aware and considerate of the, the interest, the understanding and the needs of customers, prospects and partners, especially when planning and executing any marketing activity, whether it's something as small as writing an email, uh, large as developing a content cluster or, or replying to a tweet. Um, this is especially important for, for us at Square considering the nature of what we offer, helping teams to unlock the power of their data. Um, and at Square, we, we maintain our reputation as an organization by starting with our core values. Um, which are to earn the trust of our customers, to remain passionate about providing continuously innovative solutions that deliver the best insights, and to help our customers grow with the utilization of these insights. Thank you. And Lei, how about you, if I put that question to you? Yeah, I think, you know, from <clears throat> different uh, kind of working field, what I've really learned uh, about reputation, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's very much down to uh, a brand promise, uh, whether this is... Um, you know, what the brand stand for and what value uh, the brand is going to deliver um, when, you know, consumer or customer encounters with them. I think that that whole experience of, uh, you know, brand putting themselves out there and uh, in exchange of your attention, your time, your money, your engagement, uh, what the brand is going to deliver to you, that's that live up to their uh, promises and that's really you know for me it's building the reputation I think you know interestingly you know this year has been you know notably uh, we work with uh, hybrid theory we work with a lot of uh, travel traveling brand mm -hmm. and that has been a super um, intense year in terms of uh, reputation management just you know um, when COVID hit you know brand had to had to change, cancel um, different type of like uh, travel plans. I think that whole industry segment has been like really kind of uh, <laughs> in like front and center around the reputation management. I think, you know, more than ever, this has become a very important uh, element of, uh, you know, all marketers when it's come to brand um, management and brand uh, value. Mm, you're absolutely right. I think travel's been smashed and some you can see a real difference between companies that have done really well and have built their reputation, some that have literally destroyed their reputation overnight by not giving refunds and so on. So I think that's yeah. a really good point. Um, so Leigh, just on that point, how did COVID affect your digital marketing activities in 2020? Um, and was there anything you did differently? And, you know, please, you know, reference the, the work you're doing with with Jenny and Appetite, if that's relevant as well, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, uh, we never imagined uh, uh, how 2020 would pan out. Uh, I think, you know, we started uh, the year really by planning our um, uh, rebranding for the business. So Hybrid Theory has been running about um, 10 years now. So we started very much focused on programmatic um, media delivery. Um, so as uh, time evolved, you know, we used to be called effective. Mm -hmm. um, Effective had a couple of challenges. Um, 
the first one, you know, it's um, it's kind of effective, and people always thought we did TV, which we didn't. We were purely digital, and mm-hmm. um, so um, there's a, also quite a different type of uh, kind of uh, um, products and service lines which didn't really fit under that brand umbrella. So in the beginning of the year, that we decided, well, it, it's it's good time now for us to rebrand, and um, th- that's when you know we also engage appetite to you know help us with the social with content um because that appetite has a huge experience around you know content creation in terms of ad tech and that's that's one of the areas that we we really needed support um as you know as covid hit around march time and everything just you know the plans and just went out the window you know the road show we planned for the different type of, you know, a client events and different type of um, show and tell. Uh, we had a different, you know, um, almost like road trip of different uh, areas and segment for verticals. Did you, did you, all- did you do it online, Lay? Did you no. do it online in the end? Did you, <laughs> no. did you just drop it? No, it was, uh, we, we tried. Um, I think, you know, the online is, is another thing that I think, I think there's a different, everybody is trying to adopt him. And uh, I think there's a different journey just wasn't uh, kind of fit to purpose. Um, so I think what we, you know, this year has been such a, um, in many ways that is, you know, I, I just heard, you know, someone say the other day, like, if you can run a business in the COVID year, you can run a business any year Mm -hmm. and but you know strangely this year has you know our top line has grown 50 Mm percent and our you know profit margin has grown um globally 108 percent so how did you do that then in a year of covid what what was the difference if you had to change your plans yeah i I think you know no one predicted that but there's two things what we have learned and the benefited from it um because you know the nature of the business is very much digital focused um what we're seeing, you know, straight away when people was limited around the physical um, interactions, brand went online and the digital, you know, become very dominant uh, channel for a lot of brands that we have been working with and, and for um, for pa- past quite many years. And we see the online spend actually increased a lot. Mm-hmm. And then the other like micro uh, trend we have really felt was a, uh, marketers everywhere from different uh, verticals they are so much more sophisticated now mm-hmm. uh, about um, return on investment especially for the digital channels like before you know if we had well we have brands like um, Dell we have brands like uh, quite quite big you know international brands um, you know you you would have a little bit like yeah brand building is not necessarily direct response like you don't actually get much of return you just you know build brand awareness um what we've seen you know brands like that they have been so much more now pinned down to return mm-hmm. so this applies for all b2b brands it's, it's not you know we we don't talk about what's a b2b brand um awareness metrics anymore it's, it's really about you know what's the lead generation model and how much can I generate from this media investment what are the kind of sales top lines I can drive through this, this media investment mm-hmm. I think I think it's, it's super positive thing also you know for b2b marketers especially um around you know this is uh for all marketers it's about you know putting our limited marketing investment into like a really kind of bottom line generating uh, commercially like beneficial return yeah and um, so I think you know the whole COVID situation has really stripped a lot of those I would say fluffiness around mm-hmm. the marketing and um, you know it's it's is this brand um, awareness or preferences like like you really needed to show in numbers how does this um, marketing campaign impacts. Yep. I think you know. I think those are from our business. What we can see is has a definitely you know benefited our business, and also very pleased to see a lot of like B two B marketers has really stepped up their games as well. Yeah, that's good to hear. I love the idea about the the ROI as well. And Stephen, I'm going to put that same question to you um, about how it affected your marketing activities. That's, you know, the good, the bad, things that you've changed um, would be good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like Lay, we, we had planned uh, for this year to be a game changer for our marketing efforts. 
Uh, and that was sort of the genesis with, uh, with Appetite Creative. It included much of the work we've been doing with, with the company, uh, completely redesigning and rebuilding our brand, applying it to the website, to our content, to our messaging. Uh, this is part of why I'm showing up this lovely background that we have here. That's a reflection of that. Um, another thing that we've been working on with Appetite is providing more engaging content across our social channels. This has worked very great so far. It's been a great, a, a great effort together with them. Um, and of course, in this brave new world of indefinitely postponed conferences and trade shows, we've introduced out, um, online events uh, that got some great feedback. Uh, for example, our 2020 virtual summits, which took place in June and October. We had some great presentations from Salesforce and AWS and many others. Uh, just this month, we had a really great, uh, really um, insightful webinar with our partners, uh, with the, some of the companies we work with, Refinitiv, Synecron, as well as Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, by the way, all these presentations are available on the website. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, we've, we've had to adapt. Um, and uh, like, like Lay said, it's about flexibility um, and being able to kind of think on your toes while also being real about what you're doing. And, and what I mean by that, I'm, I'm echoing Lay again, it, the fuzziness has gone away. It used, to, it used to be all pretty pictures and stuff. And then it, over time it became a mix of data and science. It's become more, uh, more science. What I meant earlier was not data and science, but art and science. It became more science now where you do have to show how this is working, why this is working. We have to justify your choices. And COVID has brought that out. It's, it's you know, it's a, not, not, not a, a, an ideal situation, but it has, it has made us all work harder to, to prove our, our, our value. It's interesting because I, I'm a massive believer in when you have a really big event, like a, a recession or, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, obviously the tragedy of what's happening in COVID, it mm. cuts away a lot of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the fluff, as you say, and it makes you really focused, you know, as business leaders, you become very focused on what your business is good at. And as marketing leaders, it's what actually is truly going to move the needle for my business, which is essentially, you know, what both of you are seeing across. Um, so it's kind of cutting out all that periphery stuff and making you really focus on what's actually really important. Um, I think looking ahead as well, it'd be really good to know more. And Stephen, I'm going to direct this at you first about the marketing initiatives you're planning for 2021. So it, I'm sure um, our listeners would really love to know more about, you know, if, has has your plans for next year significantly changed because of the experiences of this year? Are you planning to do more um, because you might have actually had lower spend this year? It would just be good to get a summary of what you're thinking at this point going, uh, we've got a couple of weeks left of this year, uh, moving into 2021. Right, yeah. Um, so we're of course continuing to improve all aspects of our marketing efforts. Um, one of the initiatives um, include um, executing our SEO strategy, which uh, you're aware of, Jen, as our teams are working very closely together on this. Uh, this is both from an on-site, off-site perspective, you know, having the, the infrastructure, the partnerships, the content properly tuned, to make sure our audience not only is able to find what they're looking for, but to get the value out of it. That's very important to us. Um, another initiative that we're focusing on is working with our customers and partners to create new digital content. Uh, we've got some really exciting webinars coming up as well as some very insightful case studies that are planned. Fabulous. Um, and Leigh, uh, same question to you. So what have you got coming up for next year? Um, so changes, things that you've got in there that are new that you wouldn't have anticipated um, or kind of leading anchor events that you might be doing. And I'd love to know, by the way, whether you are both going to do uh, in-person events next year, whether you've scheduled those in or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in-person event, definitely, you know, as soon as we're allowed, really, uh, I think, you know, the team and our, you know, partners, they, they are um, really, you know, uh, keen very yearning for you know some physical interaction so that's definitely on the table that we are we are trying to plan for next year at least um i think in terms of business direction um you know this year like even you know we have stellar result i mean it, it's still you know a lot of things like half of them is unplanned really it's, it's about you know figuring things out and we've learned a few lessons um what we've seen, you know, next year is, is actually, you know, the path that we've <clears throat> we have taken on around um, data and our platform was was the absolutely right one. And what we kind of very excited about the opportunity in especially B2B is, uh, is actually, you know, in the B2B um, sector, it's, it's so underserved um, sector. So this is, you know, true from our kind of portfolio um, clients that, um, how are they made up and also you know the, the different kind of inquiries and uh, 
um, uh, engagement we got from the B2B client because, you know, I don't know that the whole world is very much, you know, around FMCG, the, the old, you know, the media world is, is a PNG and, and all that type of like uh, very consumer centric is there's always going to be role for that. Um, but I think, you know, as the B2B marketers and segment is, is uh, you know, growing and more maturing, I think they will, will see really exciting stuff also coming from very innovative stuff from, from B2B marketers. And so that has uh, really kind of formulated one of our um, strategic direction. We're going to continue focus on B2B, continue focus on, you know, um, further kind of perfecting our um platform and, and tools and accesses um, data modeling. Um, and then the other big area for us is uh, we like to, you know, expand and growing our grow our teams as well. And um, so we have a we have a big ambition for 2021. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, hopefully will be definitely make some uh, positive ch changes in impact for the for the B2B sector. This sounds good. We've only got a couple of minutes left. So um, I'd like to just finish up by asking um, one piece of advice that you'd both give to B2B marketers moving into 2021. So Stephen, what would be your one piece of advice, please? Um, sure. Uh, you know, marketing gets more complex by the minute. There's so many moving parts. It could be difficult to understand the full picture. Um, that said, we've got so many opportunities available to us to do incredible things. Uh, for example, the marketing suite that's offered by Score, it allows you to monitor vast amounts of data related to your products, your, your markets, your brand, your, your competition, to obtain insights that allow you to engage with prospects and customers in entirely new ways. Um, so no matter how overwhelming things may feel, what's always worked best for me has been to start with the end. Um, have a clear understanding of what you ultimately need, uh, what, what the ultimate need to be, and plan backward. Um, this has been my approach to every big project, big or small, that I've been part of. Fabulous, thank you. And Lay, what was yours? Yeah, I, I think you know for for B two B marketers, um, I would really offer uh, what you know we have learned during during this year, um, especially you know when it's come to B two B marketing. So I think it's it's really the context matters. Um, so because we have seen quite a mature uh, marketing tech around kind of a B two C segment, in, you know all these targetings and. Um, prospecting conversion and those are those are very kind of established uh, process a uh, framework we have but when we come to b2b you know that's almost like the only alternative is like uh, focus on job titles on linkedin um but i think the thing is like the more and more we have learned through our clients it's you know the job titles like you, you find all kinds of job titles on linkedin and the, the fact is like you know what does a, a job title mean? Like if I have been like a, a marketing director at some point, like am I still like relevant for whatever, you know, this product, maybe I'm marketing director five years ago, like I'm, I'm already moved on. Like, so all these kind of contexts, they are, um, that's what a kind of hybrid theories data becomes very relevant because our data is refreshed every two hours. Mm -hmm. So we actually, you know, cut a lot of that kind of, uh, wastage um, from the targeting's perspective and what you know like what we learned uh, really throughout this time was you know forget about the job title it's really behavior based um like i give you a very kind of concrete example so we have a, a finance a global kind of finance products um service company so they target only on businesses um so as you know the standard linkedin targeting um the, the efficiency was never there so what we then, you know, introduced one signal into their data pool, which is like for people who visited their site, but they also, you know, it's, it's, they also kind of downloaded maybe a white paper on, you know, um, Australia corporate tax. So by combining, you know, two set of signal together, then we were able to tell so much more about this visit just to your site. Well, if this person also has a, has a read about your white paper there's there's a higher propensity or more likelihood um this is a business um owners um so like just by introducing adding so much more dimensions into a, a certain data set you can become quite um precise in b2b targeting i think you know if, if it's really you know for the b2b marketers like don't you know i would say don't settle for b2b2c uh, marketing techniques um 
there are more things and resources you can utilize to, to make your B2B targeting much better. Yeah, great. Fabulous. Thank you both very much. Um, we could talk at least for another hour. So um, I'm going to have to stop it there because I need to hand back to Jen for the next um, the next panel. But thank you so much, uh, Stephen and Leigh. We really appreciate your time. Thank, thank, you, great. thank you. Yeah, big, big, big thank you there. Some really interesting points. Um, looking at context, um, I think is a, is, is a big one and, and, and really not getting too stuck on the fact that B2B is, is business and therefore must be boring. There's, there's a huge amount of different things that can be done in a B2B world. And remembering that our B2C uh, customers are B2B customers uh, and our roles interchange in our daily lives as we move from personal to, to business lives as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leigh. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Victoria. So okay. for our next session, we are going to look at the role of media in a B2B world. Um, and also how to advise our B2B clients. So I am joined by Chian Chua, founder and director at QC Immigration, and Katie Atkinson, founder of The Runway Media. So a big thank you um, to both of you ladies um, for joining us this morning. Um, as we've been saying, it's been an interesting year to say the least, um, and it's definitely been a tough one in the way that we talk to and advise our, our clients. Um, and it's going to be, I believe, a tough one uh, for 2021. Even with the vaccinations, I don't think our problems are going to disappear yet. So it would be great to get some insight on how you've been advising your clients um, through, through the year um, and what your tips are really um, for, for 2021 in terms of building reputation um, and advising your, your clients um, in this space. Um, I guess my first question really um, is, to, is to yourself, Chin. Pandemic, is this a, a threat or an opportunity to, to grow your business? What do you think? Well, I guess initially it, 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 it's presented as a threat, but you know, as the old saying goes, behind every problem is an opportunity. So these are times where positive values can really shine, whether in a personal or professional context. Um, so for us, we found that by being there for our clients when they need it the most at times of crisis, um, it really gives us a chance to help them with their problem solving and advancing their goals. Katie, over to you. So obviously any huge cultural disruption is going to provide massive opportunities in business. Um, I think the key, and, and there have been some absolute shocking events this year, if you work in travel or entertainment, and I can't, those, those are truly tragedies. And we I read a recent report from Mintel saying that those industries aren't going to come back really um, until 2022. So my heart does go out to those people. But I think for SMEs and for small business people, the key thing is mindset. There will be a lot of people saying, you know, I had a great business and then COVID and like that was the end of my story. But it's not the end of your story. It's a different chapter. And as Victoria was saying earlier on, what I think has been so impressive is how some businesses have absolutely pivoted. Um, I spoke recently to a children's entertainer. So it's a woman who owns a company um, providing kind of high end children's entertainment. So this year there's no events. All the parties have been cancelled. So what she did is she turned her office into a studio and she got all of her children's entertainers to actually film content, like kids' educational content to put online. Mm. And, and it's so interesting. And for example, we've seen a lot of restaurants who aren't delivering food, but they've started delivering milk. They've started delivering eggs and other commodities. And I think those are the businesses that are going to survive. And reputationally, you can't help but feel absolute admiration for those businesses and how yeah. agile they are. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of ability to be able to think um, and then react. What about a media perspective for, for B2B companies? Where should they be looking to invest? In terms of paid media, obviously social, as, as everyone here knows, it's very hard now to build an organic following on paid media. Those companies need you to invest. And, and people are using social more than ever. They're trying to stay connected. They're trying to see what's going on professionally and personally. But I think something that people often overlook is the leaky bucket. So that's actually making sure that your owned assets, so your website, your social presence, your SEO is as tight as possible. Um, so for example, your images are premium, you've got the right case studies on site, you're, you're using the right terms for SEO. Um, 
for B2B businesses, the funnel is massive. Like people can be in the consideration phase for six months and you might not even know they're there. And they could have come onto your website and jumped straight off because they thought it wasn't relevant to them and you didn't even have a chance to talk to them. So yeah. I think uh, we recently worked with a client and um, we consulted on, on her owned assets. And we only, it only took a day or so, just literally doing a quick audit going, you know, that link's broken, that image is, is, is a bit repetitive, that color doesn't really work. And then she passed all of the um, learnings onto her web development team. And that week they closed four new leads. And it just shows you these are the things you can't really measure until they happen. So that, that would be my first thing before spending anything on paid media, look at your owned assets. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of, of spending on, on, on social, yeah. B2B, are all, all the social channels equal? Oh, so in terms of organic reach, LinkedIn is absolutely the king. So, you know, you put something on LinkedIn, you ask everyone, you know, to share it, to like it, to comment, and you're going to get massive, massive reach. Um, in terms of actual paid media, and it depends for an image based product you can't beat facebook and instagram like they are so powerful they're so cost effective if you're using them properly they will work for you um if they don't work for you you're not using them properly like they they are they are just amazing platforms and then obviously google google shopping google search but again if you don't already have huge awareness it's very hard to go straight into google search and expect that you're going to get a lot of sales it just doesn't work you do have to invest in brand yeah, no, it makes, makes good sense. Thank you. Jim, could you give us an example of how you've been working with your clients um, around reputation this year? Um, what's, what's kind of changed for you? And, 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 you know, give us a little bit of an insight. Sure. I, I think it, it just becomes more important than ever for them. Um, our clients are essentially businesses who hire foreign employees. So we have clients at two ends of the spectrum. On one hand, we have clients like many businesses who are struggling, who are dealing with furlough and redundancies. Now, many of these businesses are struggling themselves, but they're still doing all they can to keep people on payroll. And they turn to us for, for advice from a legal perspective and also from an immigration law perspective on how they can help their employees personally um, whilst you know, abiding by the laws and doing all they can in terms of supporting resources. Um, making these employees redundant could mean the end of the employee sponsorships and their lives in this country. So these are very much life-changing decisions uh, that weigh very heavily upon our clients. Um, clearly, our clients are businesses who care enough to want to do the right thing. So we do provide them with up-to-date legal advice on this crisis management, how we can plan a timeline strategically to deal with such sensitive matters. On the other hand, on the more positive end of the spectrum, we have several companies um, who have shortage skills, who are doing well, such as tech companies, science companies, uh, who are, you know, or companies, as Katie have pointed out, who have pivoted effectively, um, and they're fortunately expanding and recruiting talent. So we help these growing companies put in best practices to recruit employees from abroad and ensure compliance with the latest rapidly changing immigration rules. And a lot of these latest immigration rules are also affected by COVID, some more restricted, some more lenient. These best practices will ensure that they maintain a good reputation with their stakeholders, for example, with the UK government, so that they can preserve their ability to sponsor more migrant staff in the long term. Um, and obviously, you know, the way we support our clients' reputation and the way they sort of, you know, pay it forward and um, support their own employees, their own suppliers, their own stakeholders, um, it, it definitely creates a lot of goodwill all around. That's, that's really interesting in terms of, you know, creating goodwill, so not just focusing on, on profit. Is that what you mean? Exactly. I think um, at times like this, you know, we have to put goodwill and purpose before profit. We have to look at long term relationship building um, and sustainability, ultimately, which is so important to every company. Um, we can we need to realize that we can create social wealth and not just commercial wealth. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I've got a question, actually, um, from the audience. Simon Fenton actually asks, how can a business actually build broader or a more national reputation from localized roots? 
Um, I don't know which which of you lovely ladies would like to take that. Um, I'll leave it open. Um, I, I can take it and it might even be a question for Victoria actually because I think really it, the, the local routes will, will kind of define your credibility and your provenance but really for national reach you need to be in, in national press you need to be online you need to be kind of hitting eyeballs there's two ways to do it if you are truly doing something interesting then there is a story there so speaking to a PR team speaking to journalists and they'll, they'll help you get your voice out there um, apart from that you can buy Facebook ads but an expensive way to do it mm, yeah definitely um go on no do you have anything to add Jen? um yes again you know um what we found is it, it, it depends on your target audience as well in terms of uh, speed and reach to our clients personally who are our clients are a lot uh, in B2B sector, they're professionals and corporation realize that the messaging would certainly be faster and more widespread via online channels such as, you know, content, social media, Google, um, where evidence of our work and our credibility is far more visible. Definitely. Um, we've got another question. Um, do you think building reputation through marketing activities will go back to normal in 2021 or, or not? That's a good question. Um, I think that online events will continue to play a really big part because I think that people, I think the, the working from home shift is here to stay. I don't think fully, but we were discussing earlier on maybe 60-40, 50-50. And people will no longer feel that they have to go into the office when there's an event. There will be an expectation there that the event will be streamed. Hmm. Definitely a big change there. Jin, any anything to yeah, add? Definitely. I think that's a huge cultural shift here all over the world. Um, you know, it is, I think clients are expecting us to offer the online option by default. Yeah. Whereas previously it would be the face-to-face -face office option as priority. But now I think that would be the, the alternative rather than the priority. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. It's a, it's a massive shift that I think um, businesses are, are still trying to kind of come to terms with and offices and office space is, is obviously high on the list in terms of what businesses are trying to do. Um, is it possible for today's businesses to build their reputation without having a, a strong presence on social media, Katie? No way. I tried to think of a really nice way to um, answer this question. I was just like, no, no. I mean, obviously there are complimentary things that you can do, you know, such as old fashioned, like events still work. When we're allowed to go out in public, events will still work. Um, like think of things like merchandise, if it's useful, will work. But I mean, you you cannot not be online now. Like we, one of our clients is someone who fixes boilers and he's like 30 years in the boiler game. And he's now got an online product because his clients expect an online consultation now. They don't want him to come to their house because of COVID. They want something they can do online. And he's yeah. as an investment in, in a lifetime value customer. So yeah, no, no, not from my point of view. Chin, what do you think? I mean, I, I would agree with you um, in terms of our target audience. But um, I think in my industry, what we've seen is Yes, I think, I think the majority would embrace, have very quickly embraced the online model and work seamlessly with us. Um, but in, within our industry, we still, I think in the legal industry, we're just slower to adapt tech in general. Um, we still see a lot of other, you know, other companies and also certain clients. There, there is a tiny gap, um, which still relies a lot on word of mouth, especially within certain communities. Um, again, you know, even word of mouth, somehow relies a lot on your online reputation because again it, it's all about you know what they've heard what they've seen um through their friends or through their family through the younger generations that feed information to perhaps their uncles or aunts who maybe do not use the internet um, and is, is looking for a third party for advice so again having a solid reputation is the foundation here um, to maintain the goodwill for returning clients and to assure new clients. I think what would be interesting is how are we going to address the gap um, for perhaps um, the, the, the small section of the community who, who isn't looking at online marketing, or online advertising for, for their source of help. Um, you know, how are we going to bridge that in the future? Yeah. 
and, and I think as well, people who don't have access to devices and don't have access to Wi-Fi, I do think the Wi-Fi should be provided now by governments as, as a commodity. There has been a real uh, discrepancy, actually, for example, things like homeschooling with people who just don't have access to Internet mm. all of the time and those that do. And that's causing quite a division in society. So, again, that's not to get political, but that's one for government. But it is something we should be discussing. Mm. We've got a question from Claire Passos, which I probably pronounced your name wrong. Sorry for that. Um, but um, a very good question. Um, what is your advice for SMEs that are scared and have put on hold all of their marketing um, until this is over? What, what, what should they be doing, Katie? Um, I'm trying to think of a really nice way to say this, but unfortunately, and we're going to see it with massive brands as well as SMEs, anyone who stopped advertising is going to have further to climb when they start again. As, as soon as you stop advertising, like we've all read Byron Sharp, your brand awareness goes down and you have to work hard to get it back up again. It, for SMEs that have stopped, my immediate advice would be start, just start testing things. You don't know what's gonna work for you. It could be SEO, it could be webinars, it could be Facebook ads. It's all a new, it's all a new area. You don't have to put paid media behind stuff. You can try a little bit. Um, but just start testing and see what works because the longer you stop for, the harder it's going to be when you start again. Mm, definitely. Um, and then just to, to close, I think, what's your, what's your one tip for B2B businesses to help build their reputation? Shin. Well, um, I think, you know, very importantly, we have to walk the talk. Um, you know, at times like this, you have a lot of companies, you know, proudly declaring their goodwill initiatives, but ultimately, we need to start by checking internally if we live up to our own standards. Um, for example, within our team at QC Immigration, you know, we, we work, we've been doing a lot of exercises in redefining our core values. Uh, we are reflecting if and how everyone is genuinely aligned with these values on this journey that we're taking together. And also back to the uh, reputation and marketing side, I totally agree with Katie. It, it just reminds me about you know, at the start of this pandemic where people were debating, you know, should we cut spending or should we carry on spending? There were so many studies that came out looking at previous pandemics and previous recessions. They found that companies who invest in R&D when, when times are tough are better equipped to, to deal with the pent up demand when things improve. And, and the same goes with marketing. Katie, one tip um be current but don't be reactive so stay true to your values be aware that there is a pandemic happening that people are in are having some tough tough times but just don't be reactive don't think oh we can't we have to stop now or we have to have a totally different product or everything we do has to be a corona product now because things are going to start going back to normal slowly yeah i like that brilliant thank you so much ladies really great to have your opinions and your comments um We've heard from marketing directors and, and some business leaders about what they've been doing in 2020 to build their reputation for themselves and for their brands and what advice B2B specialists are giving their clients. So I'm pleased now, thank you very much ladies, to hand over to Victoria Usher, who's going to talk us through how companies can build their reputation through leadership um, and through PR. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. Lovely, uh, lovely tips um, from the previous session as well. And I'm actually going to start off by answering a couple of questions actually that were posed. And I would say I do prefer it if people do ask lots of questions um, because it makes it much more interactive. And, and, you know, you may have pressing things that I can help with. And, you know, whilst I'd like to give a really thorough answer, if I can give a very top line answer that really helps push you in the right direction, that would be really helpful. So Claire Passost asked about um, hold on marketing spend. Um, one of the points I'm going to make um, and I'll make it now which is um, there's a quote which is companies that continue PR and marketing investments see greater long-term profitability and gain stronger share of voice that sets them up for further growth so I'm just going to read the stat and this is that companies that aggressively um, advertised and put, put money into their brand and their PR efforts uh, during a recession grew on average 275% more than their competitors. So it, it really is a time, and we have heard this all over the marketing media in the last few months, when actually rather than regressing back and companies holding onto their budget, they should actually be pushing forward with it because it's a time actually when others are sitting back and actually holding onto their spend. So you are out there actually 
pushing your brand dominance, getting greater share of voice and, um, and therefore that does equate further down into a much, much greater share of the market. And then the second question, um, which was a about um, how a business can build a national reputation from localized roots, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and Katie answered that partially. And I would, I would also add and say, first of all, you need to ask yourself a question, which is, if you're localized, do you need a national reputation? So a lot of people think that with things like PR and marketing, it's really going to help them if they get on a, a big national stage. But actually, if you're if your clients are from a more localized area, there's a chance that they might actually miss that and that the more localized, maybe regional would be much, much better for you. If you've checked that question and it definitely is valid, um, then, then, then for sure it's gonna be thought leadership, which is what we're gonna be coming on to in a minute um, if you're a B2B business. So um, what that will really help you to do is to gain access to a really broad range of um, your potential key stakeholders and, and clients across the country. Country. So it, it, so PR will really help you to do that. It helps you to elevate your voice. It helps you to grow your reputation. And we'll, we'll talk through in a minute how you do that. Um, so just, for you. Go on, Jen. Go There's on. There's another one here um, that's just come in that I thought was quite good. What advice do you have for startups who are just starting out? Um, you know, what, what, what's your advice for them? Yeah, do you know what? I talk to a lot of startups. Um, so I do quite a lot of mentoring. I do mentoring with London and partners and other, other businesses. And actually, I would now this is really tricky because you have to deal with it on a case by case basis. But generally speaking, PR can sometimes be a little bit of a distraction when they first start out because it is quite a big time investment to do. And, and what what companies do is they they don't they look at PR as, as an act as a lower funnel activity. And actually, PR is all about building reputation and brand. So it's more of an upper upper funnel activity like uh, like advertising so i would say that when you're really fast scale you know pre-series a um you would either either really focus on developing your product and your sales and then pr is really something you need to do properly and um, you need to put some budget behind it it's really a, just before you get a series a or after your series a uh, round and that's when it becomes really effective if it's a if it's a sector where you really think you can benefit from pr then get yourself a freelancer um, unless unless you have somebody in-house that really knows what they're doing it becomes quite a distraction when you're actually trying to scale your business and get some power behind it and win customers so um it's very, very effective once you're at a certain level. And I would say PR works really well, like if you've got a marketing manager, for example, who can handle that because it is quite time intensive. Brilliant. We have got one more if you've got time for yeah. a question. question. Um, more, more of a comment, really. COVID-19 might be a fantastic opportunity for employers to humanise business plans and turn employees into goodwill ambassadors and ensure long-term benefits. Can you comment? Yeah, so um, I think, let me just read it again. Goodwill ambassadors ensure long-term benefits. I think really all employers need to be looking at their employees anyway, regardless of COVID. It has flagged it as a bigger issue. I think it's flagged the poor em employees that are not, um, sorry, employers that are not really looking after their staff. Um, I think, you know, humanizing business plans again, companies should be placing their staff at the, the front and center because you don't have a business unless you actually have your staff so i would say absolutely you need to be consulting with your staff you need to be talking to them you need to be doing surveys um finding out you know how they feel making sure that whatever you're doing whatever plans you've got for next year does need to make sure that they're um you know front and center and as business leaders we need to be constantly having that that loop with with our em employees and actually talking to them and finding out what's really happening on the front line because they're the ones that are talking to our customers and they are driving the business so there is no business without your employees so it's it's really really important to do that they're, they're streaming in. Um, you, you've got time for a few more? Yeah, yeah. I love questions. I won't have to present my slides then. I can get away with it. So if any <laughs> slides, <laughs> they're only if we don't get questions. I've seen them, so I know you've done them. Um, here's, here's another one. We're looking to expand into the US next year. Do we need to use the same tactics or do we need different ones to the ones um, that we've got at the moment? Yeah, so it's so a really, really good question. Um, so with thought leadership, reputation, any kind of marketing activity, um, 
but particularly I'm okay I'm going to just take PR because I can talk about marketing because I'm an ex-CMO but if you take PR for example once you have established your PR blueprint in one country it is much much easier to roll it out elsewhere so one of the core parts of doing a thought leadership program is identifying your unique selling points and what your messages are to the market and part of that is also looking at your competitor set and seeing what they're actually talking about and that will really help you refine your key messages because essentially some of the mistakes that I see in PR is that companies just career in and they just they sit down together you know just the, the CMO and the CEO and, and, and maybe a couple of employees and they decide what their messages are they don't really test it they don't get experts in they don't even look at the competition properly to see what they're doing and then they just career off and they, they go out um, and it's it's that part of any PR program is absolutely at the core it's the dna of any program it's what you need to spend actually a great deal of time and consideration on doing is that that background research to actually look at the positioning so jen you do like brand positioning for example what what uh, what we do as an extension of that is we would we would take that but we then we then extend it out to what an editorial perspective would be and and how a company needs to be positioned in the marketplace and if you take a step back and say what is thought leadership thought leadership is your unique position in the market it's really what you're offering to your clients that your competitors can't do. And in a really busy, messy market, as most of us work in, it's quite hard to differentiate yourself. So really nailing that down is really quite important and articulating that point of difference in a really smart, clever way is the absolute key. So getting experts in to really help you to grow that and develop that is really important. So then addressing the question that's been asked about going to the US or India or Australia, it's taking that uniqueness and then wrapping it in a local wrapper in those markets. Because essentially like Appetite Creative in the US is gonna be the same thinking as it would be um, in London or Spain or anywhere else. Um, you know, any, any of our clients, essentially they are the same kind of offering, the same technology, the same approach but with local considerations. So those local MDs, those local leaders are hearing maybe slightly different business stories, but essentially the technology is delivering the same thing. So it's about taking the model and the way you're actually talking about the product in terms of the, it's the solution that you're offering to the problem and then localizing it. So as usual, I've talked forever, but essentially rewrapping it around local issues. So yes. As we've been talking, we've got another four questions. Excellent. So, <laughs> go for it. You'll have to ask me because I can't see them. <laughs> oh, I'm on it. I'm on it. OK, so what advice do you have um, about investment of time and effort into owned versus uh, paid channels? Any thoughts on measurement? Um, I, I can also dive in on that as well if you want. But from a, from a PR standard? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I totally I can talk about I've got perspective on earned as well. Um, sorry, on, on, on um, owned. We do mainly earned, obviously being PR. Um, so with earned you know it does have that kudos you have got coverage in with the, from a journalist who is buying into your ideas you know you were able to say look at this article that this journalist has published about us and they are essentially talking about the solutions to the problems within the marketplace it's got that really wonderful kudos around it i would say the question is 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 also around um owned and paid for so if you actually introduce the three and i, and I will pass it over yeah. to you to talk about owned but paid for it, it is it is useful but the problem is it is advertising at the, at the same time so it will say that it's advertising and and i would say if you're going to do paid if you if you don't have time to do a really thorough pr program or you can't get into the publication that you really want to then often paid is the only way you can do it for god's sake don't make it look and read like a self-promotional article because people just completely switch off so if you're going to go that route then please look at the article and write it as if it's thought leadership and by that i mean essentially nailing down what is the problem you are solving and talk about that problem so what is the problem that your clients are facing how is your product going to help them but you're not talking about your product you're talking about the way it's actually solving the problem so that is really really important that's how you'll get eyeballs that's how you'll get more engagement through it so um so yeah any day uh, earned and owned is much better than paid for any day of the week but Jen you take you take the owned part as well please yeah you know in terms of owned it's it's really important that it's not forgotten it's it's often oh it's just our website um you know that's that's 
that's not the, the funky stuff. We want to get involved in some of the paid. But at the end of the day, no matter what you do in either paid or earned, um, you're going to be driving people back to your website. You're going to be driving people back to your own owned assets. Um, and if you don't have those in line, if you don't have the right um, UX journey for the website, if you don't have the correct ways to be able to capture those leads, then actually anything you either earn or pay for in terms of PR or advertising is a complete waste. So it just kind of smells together, doesn't it? Exactly. Start, yeah. start with the owned, get it perfect, then look at earned and paid, I would say. Agreed. Because I would say, like with our PR, what we do is we'll put in keywords. For example, we'll write an article and we'll weave that in um, to make sure that's linking up with the own stuff, like your website copy and your keywords and your SEO at the back that's going to help you search. So it's all completely complementary and should all knit together really well. Adam simbley has got one for us. Where to start um, for rebuilding reputation online? Having never marketed and only ever built a reputation organically over 40 years in niche manufacturing, we would like to start to rebuild our excellent offline reputation to put it online as a late adopter to digital online. So where, where can Adam start? Well, I mean, congratulations for going 40 years without really having touched this. I think that's fantastic. So congratulations. Um, and I would say you need to get yourself um, probably some advice. First of all, I would um, I would see if you can get yourself somebody to just give you an overview of all of the different options that are available to you and perhaps somebody to do a bit of an audit to give you an idea of, of where the best channels are for you. Um, Reputation online covers so many different areas. I mean, I can talk about the PR side and Jen can talk about some of the marketing. So for sure, I think with the, with the manufacturing and there's, there's a great wealth of publications within that, it's start by talking to your customers. What are they reading? What do you know they read? Where are your competitors being featured? So the easiest place to start is just look them all up. Where are they? Where, what's their footprint? What are they doing? Look at their site. Look at the kind of tone of voice they're using, the kind of articles and the angles that they're using. It's, it will it will really elevate your thinking very, very fast. It's, it's the most useful way to actually do it. And then that is then the next stage is um, either getting somebody in-house um, or employing somebody to then start looking at your messaging and then starting to target those publications to actually get some of those key messages out and again it's thought leadership it's what are the problems that you've been solving really well clearly for the last 40 years um and also maybe if there's some extensions some areas of business that you haven't tapped into um and sort of other sectors or, or or spaces this is why advice at the beginning would be really good to get a consultant in because if you've been going that long um then really you you, you should get somebody in to actually look to see which parts of the business could do with finessing or extending you know you've obviously got a great product there but maybe you could be doing even more so um, um, one tip I would give you, London and Partners, 10,000 Small Business Programme. Um, Jenny went on it, actually. She's just finished. Do have a look at that because that, that would be exactly the kind of programme for you. And it's got Goldman Sachs experts that would sit down and look into your business and help you. It's all for free. It says CSR programme. So that's 10,000 small businesses. Um, I went on it about three years ago. It was absolutely life changing for me and my business. Jen. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think as well, um, you know, don't don't dismiss anything, but also don't don't think that everything's um, complete as well. So, you know, look at the branding. Does does that speak for itself? If you are driving people, you are going to start driving people online, driving people to your website. Does it look and feel like it should? Um, are you projecting the right impression? You know, as much as we talk about um, first impressions in a, in a physical world, first impressions absolutely count in a digital world as well. So ensuring that you've got on a kind of all those boxes ticked as well, um, if you're going to be looking to really focus a, a, an online. Um, two questions left. I know we're over time, but I think maybe we could just get these squeezed in. Um, this is a really quick one. Um, anonymous attendee asks, do you have any advice for new B2B marketers such as fresh graduates? Oh, I feel for you at the moment, but I also graduated in a recession and it was rubbish, um, but it, it kind of strengthened me. It, it made me realise that, you know, I wasn't the absolute nuts and that actually I had to compete with loads of other graduates. Um, and I got in eventually through lots of writing letters. 
Um, first of all, I would say do some work experience. So, you know, that's going to have to be for free. Um, get your get your feet under the table, offer your services. It doesn't have to be actually within a B2B environment. It's actually any work environment that's kind of professional services. Because honestly, you know, you need to have that training just to work in an office. I was doing some mentoring yesterday with somebody that's two years in to her first job. And she said, my God, you know, like the first year is really just learning how to work in an office. And it's true, you need to get up at, you know a good time not two o'clock in the afternoon like a student and I'm sure you didn't but you know a lot of people do they they need to get used to the you know the way that everybody talks to each other in an office the, the hierarchy the hours the demands the pace all of those kinds of things you know if you've got that on your CV like three three months of experience you can quite often go in saying your your experience even if it was free um, work that you're actually doing so I think that's that's super important um so that's that's the first thing I would do um I would also so say write letters so I am I am uh, amazed at how many graduates go through recruiters um, I would never hire a graduate from a recruiter it, it pains me you know there are so many graduates out there with no experience and they go straight to a recruiter it's so lazy so look up companies that you admire and write a letter to them, write to their HR department, write to the managing director and tell them why you admire their company and write that bespoke letter. I know it takes time, but it is worth it. So, you know, maybe try and write a letter a day, spend half an hour doing it. Make sure that there are no typos, get somebody to proof it. The number of letters and CVs we get in with stupid typos is unbelievable. So um, yeah, do that. And I'm sure you'll be snapped up masses of luck. So honestly, it's going to improve next year. So I'm sure you'll get a job. Nice, nice tips, Victoria. Last one. So the whole world is going online. I think there will be a big difference to online and offline lives. Um, the latter, the offline lives will almost be reduced to our most close circle of family and friends. Brands and businesses will need to understand this. What do you think about that? Um, yes, I think, well, the, the latter will be reduced to the close circle of family and friends. I think we've got probably another six weeks of what what is what is currently happening with covid i think once the uh, vaccine actually um comes off and i think once older people are immunized i actually think that, that things are going to start to unlock so the government's already talking about easter everything going back to normal personally i know everybody's a expert it's really annoying i actually think it's going to happen sooner than that i think then what's going to happen is there's going to be like a surge where everybody just goes around you know seeing everybody it's going to be all face to face and, and and not online and then i think it's going to settle so in the last session you know katie was mentioning this i think there will there will be a natural online and offline um application now for everything whereas before it was so traditional it was all face to face and it was actually quite rare to get uh to get a, an online uh event for example uh, as well as an offline so i think what we're actually going to see moving forward is more of a balance i think you know that's still got to settle down um i think we're all kind of predicting how that's going to be but from my opinion um we've gone one way with the pendulum swung it's gone completely the other in in covid and i'm really hoping it's going to settle down somewhere in the middle and i do think as a net result of this we will have better work-life balance and we have to all as individuals be pushing for that and you know what i would don't want to see from a result of everything that's happened this year is for us to go back to what we were before everybody commuting madly into london um you know it'd be great to have people working from home more doing more online events such as this being more flexible and then you know going for more walks, spending more time with their family. I think this has been a really big wake up call for all of us to do business and to live our personal lives in a very different way. Uh, I completely agree. There's been some fantastic changes in, in mindset and, and working ability and being able to work from home and changes in work life balance. So it would be great to see, see more of that continuing. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Leigh. Thank you, Chin. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. And thank you for the huge amount of questions that we've had today. Um, been really, really great, really interactive session. Thanks a lot to everyone. We wish you um, fantastic Christmas time, happy holidays, and all the best for what is going to be a fantastic 2021. Um, a big, big thank you and have a great day.